Okay, well, good afternoon. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, we're here for a fireside chat. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Ragsdale, go by Rags. I had the good fortune of uh, serving about 40 years in the, in the Department of Defense in a variety of roles, 30 in uniform. My last role was in the Pentagon, focusing on uh, primarily cyber topics. I was a principal director for cyber and the undersecretary of research and engineering. But last summer, I transitioned to a private sector role, so I'm working for a uh, a relatively small technology-driven company uh, providing uh, solutions for the Department of Defense and customers across the whole world. Terrific, Frank. Uh, great to be here with you. Great to be here at the conference today. Uh, Dan Prieto, I uh, head security strategy for Google Cloud and Public Sector. And before going there, about four or five years ago, I was served in government. I uh, ran a defense industrial base security program at DOD and also was the chief technology officer in the office of the CIO at DOD. Also served on the White House National Security Council staff during, you know, an uptick in significant attacks on the United States, the OPM hacks, Sony North Korea hacks, the Russian election hacks, um, the, you know, uh, Iranian hacks against DOD, a range of things that made it a particularly fun time to be there. Uh, 20 plus years, long time industry, but also rotating between sort of industry, academia, and government at various points, with the intersection of my work really being the intersection of tech and data and national security. Um, uh, you know, I've also served as the advisor for a number of different country uh, companies on the board of a small Maryland-based company that does cybersecurity, uh, quantum uh, resistant encryption. I used to be an advisor to Wicker, which I see up here on the board for its acquisition by you. So thanks so much. Glad to be here. Yeah, so uh, thrilled. So Dan and I didn't know each other in our former lives, surprisingly, actually, in some of the roles that we've had. But I've got a chance to have some conversation with them. And, you know, generally speaking, when you have one of these fireside chats or panels, you look for some controversy, right? Some disagreements, so some, some uh, you know, knife play, if need be. And, but as it turns out, I, you know, got a chance to uh, both talk at length with Dan, and also see some of the, we're gonna, later on in the discussion, we're gonna talk about a paper, a thought piece that he has out there that I, I recommend for all of you to read. I think it really captures well what has gone on over the last couple of decades and what has got us to where we are today. So we're actually not gonna start with that. We thought we, we would first uh, talk about uh, that, that executive order that you all know well, that was uh, published about a year ago, just almost exactly a year ago, and following up that uh, executive order, you know, there was two national security memorandums. One which was focused on the cybersecurity of industrial control systems, and one was focusing on, you know, not surprisingly, because of the critical importance of national security systems, Department of Defense systems, and the intelligence community systems. So we thought we would we would we would start with talking about that and how it's been implemented, whether it's really made a difference. And so I'll just start with that, Dan, and your your thoughts in terms of. Do you feel like it's different than other uh, uh, official uh, guidance that we've received in the past that it's in fact moving the needle? Yeah, um, look, policy pushes and policy changes come in waves, right? The last year has been a significant and dramatic policy push. Obviously, the White House executive order being in the center of that, but we pull apart the executive order. There are three moving, strategically important pieces that we'll put through our process. As the push for much more agile, scalable, sustainable cybersecurity analytics to do better threat detection, the push around software and supply chain. Um, and, and so those major pieces, followed by supporting OMB memos, followed by supporting uh, national security memorandum, I'd say in terms of impact, we're still clearly in the first inning. I mean, whenever there's a raft of new policy, it takes several years for departments and agencies really to begin to internalize it. And, and sort of operationalize those policies in terms of what they do, right? We did a survey last summer, you know, 95% of the several thousand people we interviewed that look, the EO is great, that's fantastic, we're supportive of everything in it, but take, for example, the zero trust piece, 85% said zero trust is great, but only 30 or so percent felt confident that their agencies could implement what needed to be done within the time frames that are out there. And again, that is just a part of culture change around the new policy. Um, it's also thinking about the new directives, um, not just as some new bolt-on or some new unfunded mandate. I think the important thing to do is think about the new guidance 
as continuous with previous investments in lots of security things around identity or encryption or multi-factor authentication or threat detection. But to me, the policy is different than many past policies because it's not just telling people to get more tools. The average large enterprise has upwards of 100 cybersecurity tools implemented, right? And so it's not just saying add more stuff because we know when they add more stuff front, it's usually a one-way racket. You add stuff, you never take it away. You never take it away because you're never confident that if you take it away, you're not going to break something. What I think is different about this policy in the executive order versus others, take the zero trust, for example, is that it is the outcome oriented. It's not just the philosophy. I've heard CISO say this, I've seen the press say this. Oh, it's just a philosophy. Philosophy seems too soft, too squishy. I've also heard some CISO say, well, there's nothing new here. All the things you're telling us to do, we're already doing. I don't agree with that statement either, because what I think the new Zero Trust policy, for example, is doing is saying, look, take a range of ingredients you already have, encryption, multi-factor, strong identification, strong identity, whatever it is, but you're now required to coordinate them, orchestrate them, and integrate them in a way that drives certain outcomes. To me, what's important around Zero Trust is that it is an outcome oriented Everybody might build it differently because everybody has a different starting position. Everyone might string together different products because they already have product A installed versus product B. But the litmus test to me is higher than simply saying add more stuff. It's saying given what you have and what you might add, string them together in a way that drives certain outcomes. And for Google, we got attacked by a nation state in 09, Operation Aurora. And we started doing zero trust a decade ago, and we had to go through the same kind of transformation. And this idea of harmonizing things, the way we thought about zero trust was, look, what the network you come from should not determine what you have access to. Because we know that too often, people simply using stolen username and passwords get into networks. And you can't just have access to stuff based on coming from a network, because you can be pretending to be someone else. The second thing that was important was, we're going to make access decisions to applications and data based on what we know about you, what we know about your device, and we're going to take those things together and create a contextual picture of how you're behaving, where you're coming in from, the time of day you access things, is your device up to date in terms of patches, in terms of your identity and role, what things should you have access to do. That's multiple factors that drive the last piece of how we proceed zero trust, and which aligns, by the way, very well with this 800 seven, is every session authorized, is it encrypted, right, before we make that access decision, right? And so all these things, how do we pull together all the things we know about you to make risk-based decisions whenever you access an application or data? And so I told you before that uh, we have a silver way of thinking, but I will say this, mm -hmm. you know, come around in a couple of respects. Because it was so much uh, eye-rolling, like, Hey, it's the same old, same old. So over actually the first many months after it was published, I would say, let's not lose sight of the fact that it's also a philosophy. Yes. Right? That it is right. also right. a way of thinking. It is a way of approaching, frankly, for everyone. I think it's part of that cultural change that's necessary mm -hmm. for everyone to feel that they have some skin in the game. That zero trust environment is not just the tools and capabilities, but that each individual. And each individual throughout the whole spectrum, from right from those those low level developers that have been uh, that are that are building the, the next generation of capabilities, to those that are in the trenches using. Yeah, let me pick back up on that. It is also important to note it is not just about technology. Like what made our global implementation, or basically redoing our global infrastructure, and really changing how we do it, and getting rid basically of almost all of VPNs for our users and getting rid of a corporate enterprise network, but still doing really strong decision-making around risk when people access applications and data inside Google. Management support at the highest level is critical. It's important to note that if you do this right, it should change the game on two fronts. User experience, I mean, as W's, we all know how difficult the personal experiences with IT can be. My laptop is so slow, why does it boot up so badly? Well, it might not be the laptop, it might not be that connection, it might be the client or the security application that's on there, you don't know, but it's often not easy. When I was in FES at the Department of Defense, 
you know, come password change time, my laptop would stop working, you know, and then it would be emergency work stoppage. Like, in exact, so they would roll two or three people to my office, and I'd lose half a day of work while we waited for the two or three people to show up. At the White House, after a nation state breach of our email systems and drives, we basically lost any email older than three or four months. And in order to get access to it, you know, it's the paper forums for requesting. DOD now came in and was running networking systems. They set up a shop. You could go in during office hours. It was like going to the DMV. It wasn't the best customer experience. And we couldn't, get basically, also could not access old things for a very long time. But it should only not only change the user experience, if you move to zero trust, it should also streamline the experience for IT and network managers and make their job easier. Because during COVID, we surged with VPNs, everyone went to remote work, everybody did a great job with that. But our VPNs, as, as, as flexible, agile, nimble as you need them to be, it's difficult to manage as much as that. Yeah, and I want to, something we haven't talked about, but I want to pull on the thread you just raised, and that's the, the we, they have lots of tools. So you're either as an advocate to get more tools, but I think the discipline of eliminating tools yeah. is has to be come yeah, come in with the same breath. I, I have yeah. experience in the Pentagon, you know, uh, fancy fancy positions still doing PowerPoint late at night, mm -hmm. and I got the circle ball of death. And I'm thinking, well, this is and so I go and I look at the task, and there was there was nine processes associated with something we're trying to keep my endpoint secure, mm -hmm. running, chewing up the CPU. Mm -hmm. So I literally threw the mouse down. It was about seven o'clock, and I went home. Came back the next morning, still circle ball. It was a deadly embrace. But so we really have to have. We really need to look hard at all that we're doing to make sure that we're not stealing so many cycles and making it so hard. For Simply do their work, you know. I think zero trust helps you get there because if done right, you don't have to have as many much checking, you know, out beyond the specific fine grain checking that you do with respect to access. Yeah. That would obviate the need for for subsequent checking. Yeah. In respect, so. yeah. so I transition to another topic. Oh, by the way, very informal here. If you you have a question, or if you don't agree, by all means, please. So I'm a behavior analyst, practical analyst, in terms of what I would call risk management for making that decision. So let me parse the question. I mean, you leave a, you use your energy behavior analytics when you think about insider threat programs. I know historically have been somewhat a challenge, notwithstanding the presidential directive on insider programs. It's been a challenge to implement and scale because the collection of user-oriented analytics has a lot of privacy implications, health records, and the like. And I've seen a reluctance for traditional cyber teams to dip into and delve into that kind of data. I think there's also something that is a little bit miscast in the original presidential directive. It focused on discovering the insider threat, which means find the bad guy, which means really focus on the personal information, which is a very different thing than the way many banks and commercial organizations deal with it, which is basically not threat, but risk, which also includes vulnerability. And so there's something called global risk and compliance with automating things around, you know what, I don't care whether you're bad intentions or good intentions, you just shouldn't move this document from network A to network B or drive A to drive B. You just shouldn't email this document with this data with oneself. So I think one of the things that's important to you is you think about that User behaviors can play a role in this. I think the challenges that we can help solve is scalability, efficiency, cost of management of data and analytics, and the ability to commingle where it's appropriate and where properly governed. Lots of different kinds of structured and unstructured data, right? And I think that being able to do that in a privacy protective way, protecting it with APIs, bringing stuff from different Places with maybe only you know commingling stuff temporarily can address some of the issues that have made it hard to make as much progress on some of this kind of sensitive data and marry that with cybersecurity activities that I've seen in the past. Yeah. So I love the question and the response. You know, clearly there there are issues that are have to be accountable. We are who we are. We're we're, we're U.S. citizens. And we have civil liberties and rights that need to be protected. Mm -hmm. And we 
you ever lose sight of that, which I think is good. But when you mentioned behavioral analytics, um, the geek side of me is like, oh, you're talking about system behavioral yeah. analytics. Is what I thought, or I thought you were right. Um, because, you know, to me, that's a, it's an area that has been discussed for decades. I mean, signature based approaches will get you just so far, right? With, and if you are looking at a system that is now appearing to uh, behave in, a, in an unusual or anomalous fashion, that could give you some really keen insight right. potential. Yeah, and it's just a you know, system, but a network. So. Yeah, yeah, same, same. So, you know, anomalous, anomalous uh, activities that could be characterized as not consistent with the behavior of the system that we've understood as we understand them is another potentially fruitful uh, place to look when you're trying to uh, determine whether that system is, 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 is has been, uh, whether it's vulnerable, you may not be aware of, has been exploited and has provided a, a, an outsider the opportunity to, to, uh, to operate as an insider. You know, yeah, so um, as we're just some of the other topics teased out in the executive order, uh, they spoke very specifically about um, cloud security, right? And and uh, you raised a, an important issue that I think we need to look out for is that uh, all of the large cloud service providers, mm -hmm. yourself included, uh, work with commercial commercial and, and public entities, but commercial entities that have very sensitive that they would be, would be not in their best interest or in any way. So talk about how your experience with those partners uh, could inform uh, some thinking that those that are in, in roles and in public in the, in the public sector might want to consider. Look, you know, I said when the first inning on this new executive order, cloud first and federal policy is over 10 years old, it's over a decade. And I would argue even on that journey, maybe third inning at best, um, so it's still early days on that, and I think historically, even as recently as two, three years ago, we did surveys for people with cloud adoption. Their biggest concern among the top couple was, well, is it secure, right? A survey we did this summer, similar to the survey that I described originally, for the first time I'm seeing a shift where 85% of our respondents acknowledge that, you know what, cloud security might be as good as or better than the stuff I get sort of in my homework, because it has been so road tested by the biggest organizations out there, for example, in the private sector, number one. Number two, obviously all the bed ramp compliance stuff, that's good, um, but it's in Google's own interest and the other big CSPs to have all this stuff be very secure. I think the big questions are, again, at least in Google's environment, the cloud products that we've made available to the public are based on our own zero trust journey. So our collaboration suite, our remote access tools are oriented an inception to be oriented around zero trust. Because again, those are the innovations we made in our own global infrastructure, and the externalization of those capabilities is the basis of our product. So in terms of native cloud security, it, you know, we believe you know, strongly that we provide among the most, if not the most trusted cloud because of the kinds of hammering it gets subject to daily in the commercial front, and because to be frank, <coughs> our global systems and networks, I've seen different estimates, but a significant percentage of the world's global traffic, that is getting hammered on all the time, right? But you know what? Most of the time, you still get your YouTube up in under a second in, you know, whatever continent you, you have to be, so. Okay, so um, something we did discuss, but I'm very interested to hear your perspective on. So um, from a, from a um, Department of Defense perspective, um, uh, you certainly hear uh, issues like the desire to be cloud agnostic, the desire to be able to support multi-cloud, the, the, the desire to support hybrid cloud. So to to what extent do, do you respond to this demand signal that while we, we love to avail ourselves of services such as the Google Cloud Services and the other providers, uh, that you would You'll, you'll be supportive of the desire on the part of the Department of and other areas to have some cloud agnosticity and yeah. have some you know, support multi cloud. Yeah, I mean, look, in Google's commitment to an engineering driven organization to open source is long standing, it's a decade long standing, and it's broad. And I think we take pride in 
our ability to interoperate with other clouds. Just as an example, the work we did recently and are continuing to do with Defense Innovation, they were seeking an agile, scalable, virtual alternative to the cloud access point infrastructure. Because there were performance issues around backlogging traffic, pushing it out through the physical checkpoints. And so we proposed a solution, us and Palo Alto Networks, together as a virtualized cap. And it's based on containers. You take a container, you can put the container adjacent to the application wherever it lives, on-prem, in other clouds, right? And you put the policy decision engine in that container, and you put the trust algorithm, the thing that integrates all this different signal on whether I trust this use of this data or application at the time, in that container, it's paired with the Palo Alto firewall to do the break and inspect because it's a traffic inspection requirement as well. And we did that as a pilot. It's now gone operational. DIU, and that's an example of our commitment to one, integrating well with the kinds of tools, cyber tools you already have. Everybody knows Palo, Palo is what we use, and being compatible with other clouds. Right? So that is a deep commitment of ours is to not have people feel locked in, to be able to move workloads around, move models around the same space. Okay, great, great. So uh, really what I was hoping that we would have time to get to and we are. So so uh, Dan has written a co-author author, author, uh, called Virtually Defenseless, America's Struggle to Defend Itself in Cyberspace and What Can Be Done About It. And there's a link on the in the agenda that you could easily find it there. I'd encourage you to read it. I, you know, I mine is dog-eared and, and, and highlighted. And I think what Dan has teased out some really, really interesting, uh, interesting points. And so really what I'd like to start with is um, in some respects, I think you are you are both cautiously optimistic, but also concerned mm -hmm. about the direction that we're headed. So, be, be, before getting into the specifics, just wanted you address that. Where where do you sit with respect to your level of confidence that we're we're headed in the right direction, or not related yeah. to some of the topics you were going to pick? I think it is still goes without saying that the United States has the best cyber talent in the world. Like full stop. Full stop, full stop, full stop. There's no doubt about that. Cyber talent and cyber capability. Cyber talent, cyber capability, tech industry, protection of civil liberties, all the ingredients, right? The piece talks about, if that's all true, why we've had a difficulty dealing with stopping and responding to OPM hacks, election hacks, right? Um, all these data manipulation of our information environments by cyber means by foreign actors. And what the piece talks about is there is a really long-standing assumption in our cyber policy that date back multiple decades at this point. And in order for us, I think, to unleash our full potential and really do better on the cyber defense front, I think we need to shake this notebook and re-question some of those assumptions. One of the biggest assumptions is around public-private partnership. We've been talking about public-private partnership forever. It is an unvarnished good. It's motherhood and apple pie. But how do we put meat on those bones and get crisper about what that means? Because a lot of our policy has been governed, you know, by a view that the private sector can protect itself, and it will primarily do so by technical defenses at the point of attack. But if you look at the risk, as described by the Director of National Intelligence, the critical infrastructure, for the first time in 2020, they called our cyber threat environments acute. The DOD and the DNI do not use the phrase acute lightly. And one of the exemplars of it being acute is the fact that coordination set adversaries have the ability to basically disrupt that critical infrastructure for up to multiple weeks at a time. And what have we been doing about it? Just providing indication and warning and the like. But in a perfect world, step back. That's the equivalent of foreign forces putting garrisons on US soil and sitting them outside of electric plants. That's what an implant is. That's basically their forward deployed forces. And are we, what are we doing about it? The objective answer is those threats should be hunted and evicted. And how do we do that? We need to come together as a nation and bridge the rhetoric between public and private sector and create a true national partnership to basically make our critical infrastructure safe again, right? And instead, we get caught on these policy discussions. Is it foreign? Is it domestic? Is it the private sector's responsibility? Is government? Is it government's responsibility? And we need to get past that to solve that problem on the disinformation front. 
it is apparent that foreign actors are influencing the U.S. information environment and degrading U.S. politics and threatening things like elections from far away, and we don't have a strategy on that front either. I think the third biggest missing piece also is what are the bounds of what we do in cyber? It sort of existed on its own as a technical discipline. We read and react to breaches and attacks, sort of whack mole We haven't viewed the problem as systemic campaigns by adversaries as part of their statecraft, number one. And number two, we haven't married cyber to what U.S. grand strategy is. Now, we had a 20-year period where it was all counterterrorism. We did cyber things on the battlefield. There's a lot of cyber uh, issues that need to be dealt with below the threshold of war. And so we need to ask ourselves the question, how do you marry cyber strategy in support of a new grand strategy? And is the new grand strategy is our new grand strategy to defend democracy? If that's true, that cyber defenders have a clear role. You read, react, and defend. Is our goal to promote democracy? If that's true, then you use cyber to not just defend, but to promote. A third version of grand strategy tied to cyber might be, should we counter and undermine other authoritarian regimes? That has big implications for how you might use cyber as well. So cyber can no longer, or should no longer exist in a vacuum. It needs to be tied to a broader national Brain strategy. Yeah, and so I could uh, want to touch on a couple of points. So one is we looked at the sort of sort of ebb and flow. So you you know under under the Obama administration there was great reluctance to use this this instrument of influence, mm -hmm. right? And under the Bush administration as well. Not yes, 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 not, yes, yes, this is the yes, bipartisan yes, reluctance. Absolutely, yes. I don't want to characterize it as a as a, as a partisan yeah. issue. But then around 2018 timeframe. There was some greater openness to the Department of Defense having some authority to engage in specific operations. And the, the notion of a defense board for system engagement was embraced. Uh, and I, I, my sense, having but no longer being connected to it in the way that I was at one time, is that we're still pursuing some of the same issues. Yeah. I hear yeah. at least in the, in the public press. And those are very fruitful occasions. Yeah. You know, when, and, it's not what you're proposing, having us defend, you know, in, you know, uh, in power plants, for example. But you know, the the great benefit by going on to others' courts, we see, we can see uh, trade craft being used against again Look, others. Disrupting a troll farm before they hit you around an election. Yeah, I think that is part of the new policy, yeah. and I think that is yeah. appropriate. I think the big question is, will that new policy stick? Because we have seen. Some instances where we've reverted to an older playbook of sort of diplomatic reprisals and sanctions and indictments, and those are all strong tools. But historically, on the defensive cyber effects operation side, we've been more reluctant. The new DOD policy there to be less reluctant to engage overseas, again, to counter, for example, a troll farm or something like this. That's important. And we, I feel like we're at a transition point. We need to firm those kinds of things up as part of our new national cyber strategy and move forward. Yeah, and another positive sign related to that, uh, you know, the fact that both both Cyber Command and and uh, NSA were discovering and and, and disclosing, right? I mean, like on record, we at the NSA found this these adversary tools and capabilities and disclosing them uh, without without because they didn't have concerns about sources and that. Yeah. and that's a, a service. To the, frankly, to the global community. On that last point, strong DOD and NSA capabilities, if they get used in the defense of the overall nation, very clearly, if ever used in the US under proper civilian authority, but we already do that. NSA has already supported many governmental breach responses under MOBU with the FBI or with DHS, and we can do more of that, right? We need to cut through some of the bureaucratic ones. Yes, there's a, there's a, you know, you have to do a little manipulation with the terminology, but it's the same notion of defending forward, yeah. but we're defending forward of our, out of the Dovin, for yeah. example, when we go into, uh, and you're, you're actually right, your metaphor about them setting up an encampment outside of a, of a, of a uh, critical facility is spot on. Yeah. So I think we're, we're getting the hug. I can't leave, I mean, like uh, literally, almost formally. <laughs> um, really, uh, thank the group, appreciate the questions. We actually intend to leave a little bit more time for questions, but uh, a lot of ground. Uh, a lot of ground to cover, uh, and I really want to do uh, actually two things. That we're going to do. One, I don't think I actually said as full funded as I would. Okay, there you so go. So just to continue to pay the bills, it's two six technology we're export out of. 
out of Arlington, Virginia. And and another foot stomp on read the paper. The link uh, is on the web. And it's on the web page. And uh, thank you all for coming. Terrific.